William Shakespeare. You can't be a student of the English language or storytelling in general and not come across this man and his work at some point. Shakespeare, without a doubt, is perhaps the most prominent and important figure in the development of not only the English language, but in our storytelling of today. Almost every story we write today or movie we produce takes elements from his works. Star-crossed lovers, sibling rivalries, plots of revenge, tragic fates, ironic comedies. Shakespeare is more than a titan of literature. He's one of its patron saints. And I've had the honor of playing Hamlet in a college play, the opportunity to read most of his works, see Julius Caesar and Romeo and Juliet live. And while I was teaching, I taught Macbeth, Hamlet, Romeo and Juliet, and A Midsummer Night's Dream. Needless to say, William Shakespeare's always amazed me. I genuinely admire the man and his contribution to storytelling. I know there are those out there who claim he couldn't have done all he did and he must have stolen his work from someone else. I'm definitely not on that bandwagon, by the way. And I also don't blame people for not getting into his work. See, most high school students that I taught dreaded the idea of going into Shakespeare and wanted to avoid him at all costs because he's too hard, he's too difficult, he's too wordy. And, I, you know, I get it. I can understand some people not liking everything Shakespeare does. I'm not a fan of every play he's ever done. But the truth is Shakespeare is a challenge for young scholars. To understand his work, it requires a lot of thought, careful consideration, and an open mind. All of these things are things that Extra Credits apparently lacks. Yes, today Extra Credits tries to explain Romeo and Juliet to us. The thumbnail of their video says, Romeo and Juliet is not a love story. Already this piqued my interest. I've had students who argued for various themes and ideas surrounding the play, but almost everyone I talked to agreed that young love was the primary focal point of the story. But to straight up say that love is not a factor at all? Well, that's a new one. Let's see what they have to say, and believe me, I will be coming at this in full English teacher mode. Let's get started. Literature gives us the opportunity to experience lives, perspectives, and worlds different from our own. Though remember, friend, a good story has many readings, and this is but one. I mentioned this last time, but I need to restate it here. This line is nonsense. It's a vain attempt to hide behind any mistakes you might make or any criticism by saying, but all interpretations are equally valid. Well, I'm afraid that I don't buy that, especially not in this video, because your video is titled Romeo and Juliet is not a love story which means you're not being subjective now. You're basically telling us, hey, everything you thought about this, not true. We're about to explain why you're actually wrong. This isn't something that is just up for interpretation now. You're trying to state an objective truth. You're trying to challenge the preconceived understanding with a new understanding. You're educating us now. So you can't use this quote as your shield. That's like saying, okay, you, you know how you always thought that a lion was a cat? Actually, a lion is not a cat. It's a dog. But that's just our interpretation. You're free to your own interpretation. If you think that a cat, a lion, is actually a dog, that's fine. It's your interpretation. See how that doesn't make sense anymore? All right, let's keep going. Look, I know everyone says this is a love story, but hear me out. Imagine you're a 13-year-old girl back hundreds of years ago when they thought that was old enough to marry. Plus, as custom dictates, your father gets to choose your husband for you, and he's just picked a count twice your age. That's a double yuck. But then one night at a party, you meet this more age-appropriate boy, and who do sparks fly, even though he turns out to be the son of your family's mortal enemies. So then what happens is, actually, you know what? Instead of just telling you about Juliet, do you want a player? Awesome, you got the part. <sighs> okay, minor nitpicks here, just minor, so I'll be quick. Uh, firstly, why yuck about the chosen fiancé being older? It's a different time period, different rules, different expectations. That's why. Secondly... Your opening synopsis of the story of Romeo and Juliet seems pretty heavily defined as star-crossed lovers trope. You know, a trope all about romance. A love story. The thing you said that this isn't. So you're not starting off strong to make your case. And finally, not to get political, but does Extra Credits have something against white men? Look, I've watched all of Extra Credits So You Haven't Read videos, and in each one of them, the person with the narrator is a woman, and every one of them, except for the Dracula one, in which it's a black guy in a wheelchair. Now, here's the thing. I'm all for diversity, but I think this is an odd thing to do. You see, here's how he works it. In each of his videos, he has a person that the narrator is talking to sitting with him in a coffee shop, and the person he's talking to has never read blank book. So what the narrator does is he inserts the listener, the person with him, into the role of the main character of the story. And for something like Romeo and Juliet, I get it, because Juliet's the main character, and Juliet is a girl, so having a female play her makes total sense. But he also did the, Mount of, the Count of Monte Cristo, and the Count of Monte Cristo was a man in the book. So why did he have a female listener who he inserted as a female Count of Monte Cristo? Is everyone in the book gender-bent? Well, no, they're not. Only 
the count is. Why did you do that? I, I don't understand it. Do y'all have something against white male demographics? Again, these are just nitpicks, but it's something I felt I needed to point out. Let's keep going. Thanks so much to Bright Sellers for raising a glass to literature and sponsoring this episode. So you haven't read Romeo and Juliet. That's surprising, because it's one of William Shakespeare's best-loved, and perhaps most misunderstood, tragedies. Riddled with murders, misunderstandings, which of course then leads to more murders, and self-destruction. And at the center of it all is Juliet, who goes through one of Shakespeare's most powerful character arcs. But full disclosure up top, this tale does include suicide. So if you want to steer clear from that topic, that's totally fine, and we'll catch you next time. Okay, everybody ready? Places, please. And... Action. Two noble families in Verona, the Montagues and the Capulets, have been at war for years. <coughs> what do you mean, why? Reasons, that's why. Okay, a little bit of trivia here. The Montagues and the Capulets were based on two real Italian political factions in the 13th century called the Montecchi and the Capuletti. They competed against each other to gain the favor of the local king to win power and wealth. And it's true that this isn't mentioned in the book, and they never do explain in the actual play why they're fighting, but that's because the reason for the feud is not a major point of the story. The feud is a point. The, the, um, region, the reason, the origin for it, not. Okay, moving on. Anyway. Fed up with their constant street brawls, the local prince vows to execute the next person who picks a fight. Cut to Romeo, the only son of the Montagues, having just gone through a pretty bad breakup, so his friends try to cheer him up like typical teenagers would, by making dirty jokes and deciding to crash a party at the Capulets. Meanwhile, Lord Capulet meets with Count Paris, who wants to marry the Capulets' only daughter, Juliet. She's unimpressed when they break the news to her, but she's an obedient daughter, so she consents. But that night, at the Capulets' masked ball, our two only children make masked eye contact and immediately fall deeply into masked love. Aww. You know, I notice you keep calling them children, and by today's standards, yes, they would be, but you said yourself that in this time period, it would be old enough to marry. So to the people in the story, they are not children. I know why you call them children. You want us to see them as sweet, young, innocent kids being torn apart by mean, hateful parents. But bear in mind, by your own admission... At this phase of their life and in this time period, they are young adults as far as their parents are concerned. So, moving on. But Juliet is stunned after when her nurse informs her that her new beau is none other than Romeo, the son of the family's Montague enemies. Later that evening on her balcony, Juliet laments that she's fallen in love with a Montague, but comes to the conclusion that she'll love him in spite of his name. Meanwhile, Romeo has snuck back into the Capulet estate to see Juliet again and overhears her. They confess their love for each other, and Juliet asks Romeo to promise that he'll arrange for their marriage the very next day. True to his word, Romeo visits his friend, Friar Lawrence, who hopes to end the family feud by marrying the two youths. <sighs> two things. Um, number one, not to be political again, but why is the friar black? You know, that wouldn't be accurate for the time period, but why? I think in extra credits, the rule is the more evil, the lighter their skin tone or something. I don't know. And number two... Please keep in mind what he just said there. The friar wants to marry them to end the feud between the families. Keep that in mind. Store that in the back of your head. Moving on. The nurse then brings word of this to Juliet, who immediately sneaks out of the house and marries Romeo. Okay, time for an intermission. Like all of Shakespeare's plays, Romeo and Juliet closely follows principles of classical Western theater. The five-act structure, for example, comes straight from Roman times, and the emphasis on poetic language was paramount as far back as Greek theater. Shakespeare also employs an element of classic tragedy called a recognition reversal, a moment where the tragic hero recognizes some truth and then reverses their relationship with certain characters. Romeo and Juliet has been staged, adapted, and reinterpreted thousands of times since it was first performed in the 1590s. It's been reimagined as everything from an opera to a musical to a Boz Lerman fever dream, which I love, do not at me. This explains so much. Don't worry, I won't hate you for liking that heinous adaptation, but I and my brother will both hate that movie. Vehemently. And even a zombie rom-com. Heck, the story didn't even originate with Shakespeare, you know. The great bard of Avon used earlier literary works as the basis for his story. In fact, if we want to get real for a moment, most of Shakespeare's plays weren't original tales. Because back in the Elizabethan England theater world, you could actually move more tickets if the plays were based on well-known stories. And this, of course, was years before copyright law. And what? Oh, right. Sorry. Let's get back to our love story. 
Okay, you know, I liked how you chucked that in there, but didn't provide any context, implying that Shakespeare wasn't an original writer and just took from others. Look, it's very true that Shakespeare was inspired by other pieces of art, literature, and history. But we don't celebrate Shakespeare so much for the originality of the concepts as we do the literary stylings he created and pioneered. For example, The Lion King from Disney is heavily based on Shakespeare's Hamlet. But we don't remember The Lion King for being based on Hamlet, or having similar themes as Hamlet. We remember it for the style of its animation, the massive scale of the art, the gorgeous imagery, the memorable songs, and the magic that only Disney can provide. In the same way, Shakespeare was influenced by historical accounts, other pieces of literature, and other forms of art. But we don't remember his work for what came before, but rather what Shakespeare brought to them. That's important to note. Which is about to turn into a hot mess. Our newly married groom is confronted in the street by Tybalt, an angry Capulet kinsman nicknamed the King of Cats. Romeo tries to make peace with Tybalt, but then Romeo's friend Mercutio challenges Tybalt instead. As the two fight, Romeo tries to break up the swordplay, and Tybalt takes advantage of this, killing Mercutio. Now enraged, Romeo then kills Tybalt, and the Capulets demand justice. However, since Tybalt did start the fight, the prince mitigates Romeo's sentence from death to banishment. Then when Juliet learns that her cousin Tybalt is dead, and that her husband is banished, she's despondent, until her nurse and Friar Lawrence arrange a secret, pre-banishment, wedding night for the young couple. What is with these adults trying to get teenagers to hook up consistently? You know what, I'm just, let's move past it. And remember when I told you to hold that thing in the back of your head, that last little thing about the Friar? Okay, going into teacher mode here. <clears throat> okay, class, why do you think the Friar wanted to marry Romeo and Juliet so quickly? If we remember what was established earlier about their families and the friar wanting to end this family feud, perhaps it could be because he wants to end the feud through their matrimony. Very good. Remember that. It'll be on the test. And, uh, uh, ex extra credits, extra credits. Stop sniffing glue in the back and pay attention. Stop, stop. No, you stop that. You might learn something. No, stop. See why this bothers me? They said it themselves, but it's like they just forgot. Moving on. So that night, Romeo sneaks into Juliet's room and the next morning slips off to banishment. Shortly after he leaves, Juliet's parents come in with great news. She's to marry Count Paris in a few days. Juliet refuses, and as her raging father threatens to disown her if she doesn't marry Paris, neither Juliet's mother nor her nurse will help her. This is Juliet's moment of recognition and reversal. She recognizes that she has to make her own decisions and that her relationship with her family must irreversibly change. <laughs> You are 100% wrong, sir. This isn't even a matter for debate. This, this is actually poor interpretation. This is poor understanding of the literary device you're talking about. This is not recognition and reversal. Time for a crash course. Recognition and reversal was first given as a literary and life ideal from Aristotle. Recognition is changing from ignorance to knowledge. The character who is going through recognition is provided new information that they did not have previously. This new information can potentially lead to a reversal. The reversal is a complete change in one's cognition and outlook on someone or something based on this new information. For example, in The Lion King, Simba blames himself for his father's death. He thinks it was his fault. He doesn't know Scar did it. That's why he ran away. He wanted to avoid the sin and the shame of his past. Ah, so you haven't told them your little secret. Well, Simba, now's your chance to tell them. Tell them who is responsible for Mufasa's death. I am. But, as Scar is about to execute him, Scar reveals the truth. This is the recognition, the revealing of new information. Scar tells Simba he was the one who killed Mufasa. This causes a reversal in Simba. He no longer feels shame in himself. He no longer sees himself as the murderer and now sees Scar as the criminal. He even says as much when he gets back up. Murderer! 
All right, that wasn't enough. Here's another one for you. In Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back, Darth Vader drops a huge bomb on Luke. Luke thought Darth Vader killed his father, and he hates Vader for it. He won't join Vader. He wants, to pay, he wants him to pay for his father's death. But Vader reveals the recognition that he is Luke's father. He told me you killed him. No, I am your father. This causes a reversal in Luke. He no longer wants to kill Vader. He wants to save Vader. I can't do it, Ben. You cannot escape your destiny. You must face Darth Vader again. I can't kill my own father. This also makes him change his view of Ben and Yoda, who he thinks lied to him. This is the reversal and recognition. Everyone says recognition, and a lot of people take that to mean, oh, it means that they recognize something new. No, it means that their cognition has been rewritten. The way they understand something has changed. It should be said recognition and reversal. Juliet here, in this part of the story, is not being given any new information for this to be a recognition, because she already knew that her father wanted her to marry this person. She already knew it, just the timing has changed. And she's not doing a full reversal because even though she agreed to marry him at first, it's clear she wasn't happy about it. Her cognition has not changed and her opinion about it has not changed. She's just changing her stance now. And your explanation for why it is recognition and reversal is ludicrous. You think her recognition is that she just recognizes a truth about herself. That's not recognition. That's compliance or admission. She was making her own decisions when she frickin' married Romeo. She, she was already making her own decisions, and she knew it would change her relationship with her family because she did, it, she did everything in secret. Nothing about this is recognition and reversal. If you want real cognition, recognition and reversal in Shakespeare, look at Othello, one of his best examples. Again, extra credits, stop sniffing glue, and stop applying what you want to see in the story. Let's move on. So she decides to go to Friar Lawrence, and if he won't help, she'll commit suicide. Now, since Juliet's already married to Romeo, Friar Lawrence's religious beliefs prevent him from marrying her to Paris. So he suggests she fakes her death to escape her family and join Romeo in exile. Oh, and wouldn't you know it, he just so happens to have a potion on him that can make a person seem super dead. Why does he have this? Reasons. Juliet then takes the potion home, and Friar Lawrence sends a messenger to Romeo to let Loverboy in on the plan. Upon Juliet's return to her family, she tells her father that she'll marry Count Paris. And boy, is he ecstatic. So he moves up the wedding to the very next day, at which point she drinks the potion and immediately falls into a death-like sleep. And when the nurse discovers Juliet dead, House Capulet goes into mourning. And it's about this time that Friar Lawrence's plan goes completely off the rails. Turns out the messenger he sent Romeo to let him in on the plot got delayed. And instead, one of Romeo's friends informs him that Juliet is actually dead. So he buys actual poison and travels back to Verona to die next to Juliet's body. But when he sneaks back into her tomb, he encounters Count Paris. They fight, and Paris is killed. Then, in a surprise moment of dramatic irony, Romeo drinks the real poison and dies, just as Juliet is waking up from the fake poison. Then, realizing what has happened, Juliet takes up Romeo's dagger and kills herself. While Juliet's love of Romeo is absolutely one motivating factor, her realization that her family doesn't necessarily care about her actual happiness also leads her to make many of her fateful choices. So ultimately, far from being a story about the power of love, perhaps Romeo and Juliet is more of a meditation on the cost of hatred. The pointless war between the Capulets and Montagues for reasons destroys their young people, and all the survivors can do is build monuments to their loss. So this is it. This is what you think Romeo and Juliet is really about. That pointless feuds kill young people and ruin lives, and that hate will destroy the potential of happiness. That if we could just learn to put aside our useless squabbles, our children might live longer and happy. Well, that is indeed an intended message of the play, I will grant you. I'm sure that's a part of it. But tell me, what did the play center around? The feud or the lovers? This is one of the original stories to begin the star-crossed lover's trope in romance. The feuding family is the backdrop for why the two are star-crossed. 
But the story is not about the redemption of the Capulets or the Montagues. It's not about better understanding the Capulets or the Montagues. In fact, you'll notice that the Montagues themselves do precious little in the story outside of exist. Yes, the actual play does end with more information on the Capulets and the Montagues, but you you actually leave out that from your interpretation of the play. You end with Juliet killing herself. You leave out what happens when the bodies are found. You leave out what what's happened when things are better understood. Like, man. It's actually kind of ironic because the Capulets are far more present in hindering Juliet's love. You could actually look at the Montagues and the Capulets as very opposite individuals. The Montagues are more open and allowing of Romeo to do what he feels like. That's why Romeo can get away with running around with his friends and causing trouble for the Capulets by sneaking into a party. Why he's free to do as he feels like and date girls as he wants to. The, the Montagues kind of have an open hand policy and that can be interpreted as a bad thing as well as a good thing because it allowed Romeo to get into all kinds of trouble, which, which is why he ended up exiled in the first place. And and then you have the Capulets who are way more controlling. They want to make sure that they take care of their daughter. Everything's done for their daughter. They have to make sure that she's following all the rules, staying away from those bad Montagues. You know, it, there's a very, and that can be a good thing or a bad thing because it's a good thing because they're making sure that their family's being taken care of, but it's a bad thing too because it leads to Juliet wanting to rebel. You argue that the story is about Juliet realizing her family doesn't care about her happiness, but I ask you, what did she tell them about Romeo? Did she care about being honest and upfront with them? Did she care about openness or fairness she did everything behind closed doors she hid the truth from her family for all her family knew they were concerned about her happiness by having her marry a man who would secure a bright future for her and for her family see this is one of the big problems that i have with this kind of um idea like oh they just wanted her to marry this guy she didn't actually love this is a story about how family just doesn't care about that no they actually do because arranged marriages quite uh, quite often are done for a specific purpose what do you think that purpose is to secure a future for the daughter. To secure a future for the daughter and the son. They need to secure that. They need to make sure that they're going to grow up happy and well off. What does Romeo offer her? He's exiled. He has no family. He has no money. What is he going to offer her? Heck, they don't even know she's interested in Romeo because she won't tell them. I'm not saying what they're doing is right or wrong. I'm saying your argument is they don't care about her happiness. They did. They did, but another aspect of this is you say it yourself, they're teenagers. You know how often teenagers say, you just don't care, mom. You just don't understand, dad. You don't get me. Unfairness is hardly a focal point for any child or teenager in this case to be arguing about. At what point was it apparent that her family didn't care about her happiness? You know, it's funny, if the story focused more on the fathers and the reason for their feud, showing us how pointless it is, maybe then I could see your argument as to why this is the main theme. But I, but they don't. The reason the feud is kept ambiguous in its origins is because it's inconsequential to the real purpose of the story. But we'll get to that later. Yeah, again, it never really sounded like a love story to me. But you know what? Don't take my word for it. Because our humble animated synopsis is no substitute for reading or seeing the play for yourself. Because as old Billy S. might say, if you're going to read a Shakespeare play, check the listings for your theater seasons. And there each word you'll hear the actors say will help you grasp both his rhymes and reasons. Now take a bow, everyone. You did great. It never sounded much like a love story to you. Not to be rude or anything, but are you actually stupid? To quote another Shakespeare play, I do wish thou wast a dog, that I might love thee something. It fits here because I can't think of one thing I liked about your synopsis of this play. The funny thing is that of all of Shakespeare's works, I was never a big fan of Romeo and Juliet. I never felt sorry for the characters, and I always thought the decisions that Romeo and Juliet made were immature and foolish. But that's part of why I think the theme of Romeo and Juliet is not truly about the power of love or the beauty of love, but rather something different. Now, granted, take this with a, with a grain of salt, because I'm by no means a scholar of Shakespearean quality, but this is what I formulated with my time with the play. I believe that Romeo and Juliet's primary theme is about the brief joys but dangers of young love. Really think about Romeo and Juliet as the play starts. Romeo and Juliet come from opposing families, true. But think about what the two individuals are going through. Romeo went through a bad breakup. He's feeling lost. He's feeling dejected. He doesn't feel like he has anything. His friends are trying to help him get over it, saying, hey, come on, let's go pull some pranks on those Capulets. Let's have some fun. 
Meanwhile, Juliet just got word that she's going to be put into an arranged marriage with a man she barely knows, and she agrees to it because, you know, it's what dad and mom want, but I just don't see myself being happy with this. But there's a party tonight. I'll go to that. So at the party, both young people are feeling dejected, weak, at a loss, and then their eyes meet. And instantly there's an infatuation. Not love, just an infatuation. Just, this person's close to my age and handsome, and they seem to like me. This girl is close to my age and handsome. They seem to like me. And the two enjoy a wonderful night together, only for them both to realize later, wait, that person was from a rival family? And then this makes it even more interesting for them. Because now, it's rebellion. Juliet loves this. It's like, yes, I can kind of get back at my family now. Because nothing is more cathartic for a young mind than a little bit of rebellion. Most teenagers act rebellious by nature because they want to break free of family ties. So Juliet wants to break free of her family name. When she says, Romeo, deny thy father and refuse thy name, it's often interpreted to also be talking to herself. Deny what your father wants. Deny your family. Do what you want to do. Live the way you see fit. Marry this person you barely know. In fact, think about it. Their whole relationship is going in fast forward. They just meet and have a conversation together one night, and suddenly, let's get married. It's, it's instant. Remember this in Frozen? Wasn't that a big thing that everyone laughed about in Frozen? But no, this is somehow, oh, it's such deep love and romance. It's the same thing as Frozen. But moving on from that, then they instantly get married, and then a day or two later are consummating the marriage, all of this behind closed doors, not telling anyone about anything, Meanwhile, the secrecy of the two are kind of making things weird for the Capulet's family going, she's up to something. Well, don't worry. Once we get her married, she'll be happy and we won't have to worry about that anymore. You're going to get married in a few days. Oh, I don't want to do that anymore. Why not? You were all okay with it earlier. Well, I don't want to do it. Well, tell me why. No. Well, then I don't understand it. You just don't care, Daddy. See? This is immature. It's young, immature, non-thought-out love. Think about this for a second. Imagine if they did escape together. They run away into exile together. What do they have? Have they thought this through? Do they have any money? Do they have a life? Do they have opportunity? Do they know a trade? They're 13 years old. They don't have anything. They may be young adults, but usually that's why you have arranged marriages because the parents know who would be a good fit for them and who would be able to take care of them. Here, it's just love for love's sake, and it might not work out. In fact, you could argue that part of the reason why they ended up dead is because they didn't take their time and work out a better plan. Part of it may be because they weren't secretive enough or mature enough to handle it. That's what I think the real message behind it all is, that yes, the hatred between the families is a problem. Don't get me wrong, it is an issue. But it is the backdrop that leads to the story of the star-crossed lovers. The story is not trying to teach us, don't you realize, people, if you just stop hating each other, your kids will live longer. How do you think that's the message? How do you think that's the intended takeaway? Who would he be talking to in that instance? I think Shakespeare was, for one thing, giving a bit of dramatic irony, talking about, hey, all you young lovers out there who see this as love, unrequited, this beautiful image, don't you realize how immature you all are? I think this is Shakespeare jabbing a little bit at the audience. Shakespeare loved to poke jabs at his audience. That's part of the reason why his writing was always so eloquent in dictation. He was kind of mocking the aristocratic ideals of the higher-ups, making, making it sound like, this is how you guys talk, and you probably don't even understand what I'm saying in this play, but you're going to pretend like you do because of your sycophantic-like attitudes. And here he may be making fun of people, too, who watch and go, oh, it's so beautiful, such wonderful love. You realize they're immature brats, right? <laughs> you realize they're going to end up dead, right? I almost feel like Shakespeare was kind of making fun of the audience. Making fun of this, oh, we just want love and passion and, oh, just, it's so beautiful. Nope. It's actually going to end kind of ugly. <laughs> but that was always my thought on Romeo and Juliet. That's what I came to. And I've read a lot of different ideas about different th small things that you could take from it, different aspects of each character that you could take from it. But I've never once heard anyone argue, it's not a love story. It's a story about anti-hate. I just don't see that. I can't see that. But what do you think about Romeo and Juliet? Have you read Romeo and Juliet? If you have, what did you think about it? Guys, please understand, 
If you don't like Shakespeare, that's totally fine. I get it. Me and my brother don't even like Romeo and Juliet that much. We much prefer stuff like Titus Andromeda, Hamlet, Macbeth. Those are much more interesting and engaging to us. But Romeo and Juliet is still a very well-written play, and I think it deserves some real depth analysis. And extra credits ain't doing that here. This is a very, very weak interpretation and explanation of the play, and I think it's very misleading. But anyway, guys, that's going to wrap us up here. I hope you guys enjoyed, and I will see you in my next video. Take care.